and then we'll make this stop. And then put it back up again. Yeah. So uh, it was wonderful listening to everybody else's um, presentation this morning. I made lots of notes on my iPad as I was, as I was going along, but I'm going to focus a little bit more in on a school improvement model that we've used. And I say school because Dartmoor Multi-Academy Trust is actually made up of currently 17 schools. We've got two in a management partnership and we're just about to open one more free school. We've got one free school open trust already, which is a special school. So we're talking at a much larger scale um, and it's scaled up really, really quickly across the trust. So um, it, it's a slightly different take on some of the things we've heard this morning. We serve just over five and a half thousand uh, young people in the trust. But the schools range from large secondary school, of which I used to be a principal of one, um, with 1,500 children in, down to the smallest Church of England primary schools with 17 children in. So it, we're looking at a really range, a wide range of schools serving quite a range of communities. And I think what's probably different from what I've heard this morning about the communities we serve is that Devon is very much a, a Tory stronghold. Our local MP is Geoffrey Cox. He is returned every year with one of the largest majorities you can imagine, uh, which is why Devon misses out on funding because there's no need to support Devon uh, because it's already a Tory stronghold. So it, it's a very different uh, community in which I'm used to working in. In the previous um, leadership roles, I've been leading schools for just over 20 years now, uh, did have 30 odd languages spoken, very multicultural in Plymouth. And whilst Plymouth is still in Devon, very, very different from the schools we find in Dartmoor. So with the challenges that we have are very different from the challenges that we've been used and I was used to previously and that's what's kind of driven some of the work that I've done being able to lead across my role as executive director of schools means that I have an opportunity to drive cooperation freely uh, because I'm kind of unfettered in my role I've got quite a lot of freedom in, in what I do to drive cooperation through our schools but I need to make it clear that all of our schools are academies um, some of them came from cooperative trusts that existed, um, schools of foundation status previously, and some of them are Church of England schools. The majority of our children, though, the vast majority came from cooperative schools. So we did have a bit of a history. But when the trust set up, it was set up in a very well-intentioned way back in 2018. Uh, and my school at the time, Tufstock College, went into partnership with a number of schools deliberately um, to, to address the issues that were going on in Devon at the time, which I won't bore you with. Um, but it was only well-intentioned. There was no proper, it went awry, I suppose. There's no setting up of this trust effectively. And so we had an opportunity about just over a year ago when our current CEO, Dan Morrow, some of you will know him, Lee's alluded to him already, came along that we were able to re-establish and put what I put on the slide there is reclaim our cooperative identity. Um, so we decided that's what we were going to do. So Lee, if you could do the next slide. In doing that, that's, you've probably seen that picture many times. I use it quite a lot, but we feel in Devon, I feel in Devon, that we're very much the fox there in the, in, the, in the picture. And I think the key message is we're constantly learning of how to do that. So, you know, it's a very popular but lazy caricature of uh, cooperatives that um, they are time consuming and don't serve any purpose. That's what you hear quite a lot from, from Devon Local Authority, which is one of the reasons we, we converted to become an academy and from other people, interest groups saying cooperation doesn't work, cooperation is slow, cooperation is pulling us in the wrong direction. Um, and it's been my job to establish that cooperative identity to show that it really does make a difference to young people and make the difference for education in this part of the world, because I absolutely 100% believe that is the case. But you have to be the fox, I suppose, to understand that. Um, because we're not, I can't allow us to swim against the tide. And that's what in previous um, existences of schools that I'd worked in, we're trying to swim against the tide. And actually, we're not, we have to go with the tide, but we have to embrace the the, the changes and turn them into cooperative opportunities. And that's what I'm really gonna talk about, how we've tried to do that um, and build on this model, our school improvement model of uh, democratic fellowship, which I'll come to eventually when I, when I get there. Um, and the starting point within that really is that we have to get our culture right. So if we're gonna be the fox going in that direction, hidden amongst the hounds for, for um, 
for our work, it's really important, the starting point in what we, I set out to achieve in making cooperation work and, and to be sustainable was to get our culture absolutely right and get our goals and behaviours aligned to that. So very early on, we started writing um, what it meant to have cooperative behaviours, what it meant to have a cooperative leadership model, what it meant to understand how cooperators behave and how they interact uh, with other schools and within their own communities. And if we didn't do, if we hadn't done that work, I don't think we'd be as strong as we are becoming uh, now. Just a year in, we can really see traction around a lot of the work that we are doing since Dan came along and, and reflecting on the struggles that we had previously. And we certainly aren't there yet and we certainly haven't finished learning and we're on that upward trajectory, but it's real. And some of the, the exemplification I'll give you, I think, will show that it is real. The model of democratic fellowship fits in with this um, these set of talks as conference really well because it relies really, really heavily on, on agency, agency from different stakeholders, but also personal agency and distributing authority across our trust. That's another matter that we, we really work hard on. So we're trying to build this, this whole set of democratic fellowship principles within what we've heard today, I think is a rather fractured education system. Um, and we have to be prepared to be that fox and, and not morph into something else. And cooperation has never been easy. Any, all of your cooperators, cooperation is not the easy option. Cooperation is the hard, the hard option. And when people tell me um, you don't need to, you know, don't, don't worry about culture because, you know, it, it really matters because the culture underneath it tells you to examine those values and principles of the cooperative movement and understand how hard they are to embed and how important they are. And I'm often caught, caught out saying cooperation is not easy because it absolutely isn't. But it, to the uninitiated, it does seem like this cosy concept. Um, and it means we're just being nice to each other and supporting each other. And it really isn't that because it takes that courage, I suppose, to shine the light in the dark corners and to be brave and have the confidence to lead in a different kind of way. Um, maybe we're foolhardy, I don't know, but we're really trying to lose what we heard previously of this, this fear, the fear factor that we have uh, running through our education system, we're having to do things, having to teach in a particular way, having to run our curriculum, having to set our schools up, having to convert to become academies if you don't want to. It's all centred in this fear and drive that something bad will happen if not. And what I'm suggesting today is actually it's the peer factor, not the fear factor that makes the difference. It's having a peer group that we can work in. And that is the fundamental basis of our democratic fellowship. And it brings many, many opportunities, not constraints. Um, as, as we move forward. So Lee, if you could move on to slide three, because these are what, when we were building this model, we saw the challenges, and this is based upon um, Kerry Face's work really and Julie Thorpe uh, from quite a while back, about 2012, but the challenges for building this cooperative identity fell into those four categories. If we were going to be successful, we felt we had to address those four areas. So informing about cooperation, experience and enacting cooperation, learning through cooperation, and then creating this new vision for, for society. And that's quite ambitious. And I don't apologize for that because I think that's, if we're going to do something, we have to do something together to make a difference um, for everybody. I suppose the first bit then informing about cooperation is the easiest bit. Um, telling people, creating resources for our students and our staff. That was relatively easy in building our culture. Becoming activist in the, in the community, actually we could write and talk about what we were trying to achieve relatively easily. So we, it isn't that hard to inform people about cooperation and to be passionate about it. But that certainly is one element of our work. And we do that all of the time. We also develop critiques of uh, competitive and capitalist behaviours. And Lee, I sent you a paper about what cooperative leadership is about. And it's a critique really of the model that we all work to. And, and an awful lot of leadership books, particularly traditional ones, don't embrace this concept of fellowship whatsoever in leadership. It is about hero leaders or even servant leaders, but it's about leaders, not leadership. 
So I suppose informing about cooperation is increasing the visibility of, of cooperation. And that's relatively straightforward. And the work that we've done there, I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. The, the experiencing and enacting um, cooperation is a bit harder and it takes time. And people are very often put off by not seeing fast enough wins. And you, you can run two things hand in hand. You can run traditional ways of running schools and build cooperation next to it. So you can be experiencing it and enacting it whilst you're still running a separate model alongside. There's no conflict for me in that. The uh, church schools, Church of England schools that exist within our trust are not cooperative schools. And they, it's been a journey, but the Diocese of Exeter isn't like the other, the Diocese of Truro. They enabled um, trust to set up, multi-academy trust to set up with Church of England schools within them. But the Diocese of Ex Exeter wouldn't allow that. And yet we find, yet we find that they are working through uh, our ways of, of being in a more sustained way than they were through their cooperative, their, sorry, their Christian distinctiveness. The cooperation is coming large because they can see the difference it's making to young people. So we're enacting the elements that I'm gonna describe in a moment, day by day, day by day. And one example of that, we've linked in with Citizens UK, which is an ethical organization, some of you be familiar with it, um, that have brought together um, some of our Church of England schools to say, actually, you can, you can do this, this work fits nicely with incorporation. So doing that is the next stage. Learning through cooperation is probably the most powerful thing that affects young people. And we've heard plenty of opportunity, plenty of examples of that this morning already. It's developing the experience of young people and staff to maintain spaces for their expression, their voices, debates, matters that concern them, matters that concern the trust, governance fits in there, how you allocate resources to your curriculum, how you bring about changes in your pedagogical practice. All of that is learning through cooperation. And then the biggie, which I think we're doing today really, uh, is emulating the, the move, new vision for society. How, how do we take this work and make a difference that sustains? And, and it's learn, learning those skills to, from other cooperative institutions and creating your set of cooperative behaviours that eventually become not a policy that's just written on a piece of paper, but a policy that is lived. And I've never really been one in schools for forcing children to be able to recite back to me the cooperative values. It's much more about how they live those, much more about how what they are doing around democracy, how they understand solidarity. Um, those, those things matter to me much more and I feel it's exactly the same within our staff and our school Im improvement model is investing in this all of the time. One of the principles of the movement, of course, is education and training. So you would expect, wouldn't you, a, a cooperative trust to be able to invest heavily in CPD and training. And we don't just do that through courses. We do that through the ways that we interact and the ways that we behave. So, yes, it's ambitious, but those were our challenges. My challenge is how I scale that up from having led a cooperative school in Plymouth into a cooperative school in Devon, into how, how I now make 19 schools, soon to be 20, um, in, into this model. And it's not about copying practices. You can't listen to what, what we're going to talk about in a moment, all those practices, and think that they are transferable, because it is the process, the, the journey you go on in making a cooperative organisation that is the power, not in taking the practices and thinking that you can emulate them and copy them elsewhere. And people say, you can do all of what you've done. This I've had this a lot thrown at me. You can do everything you've just described um, if, you, if you're not a cooperative. You, you can be collegiate if you're not a cooperative. And my answer to that is, yes, but it's fragile. Without, without actually tying yourself down to a set of values and principles and promising that you will deliver on those, it becomes open to mutation. So whilst I showed you a picture of going with the, going with the pack, it doesn't mean to say you are the pack because you do still have to make sure you stick to what you really believe in. And it isn't always easy as we've heard today. So can we go to the next slide, um, Lee? Because these are the elements that we've worked on uh, in order to create that sense of democratic renewal. 
to make sure that we've reclaimed our identity. And we've, we've, I've already talked about getting that cooperative ethos. It takes time. You have to strengthen your community, your real sense of purpose. And through that, I think it's what you what you uh, value and what you believe in will be the things that people will copy. So we we have leadership from bottom up and we are we serve those people. And that is our ethos. Uh, we have a whole set of charters that we write and their promises that we make to each other. Um, the way we set up the organisation, we make we make that ethos front and centre of everything we do. Then we have a cooperative governance arrangement. And it was interesting listening, as I said before, to people that have struggled with the forum. Because in each of the cooperative organisations, schools and now trust that I've led in, creating the forum and making it work has been the biggest challenge of all. And I don't really understand because on paper, you'd think that would be the, the most important part because it's the stakeholder voice. It, it's the leadership of stakeholders. It's, it's being able to consult widely. And yet it seems to be the hardest bit to actually make stick. So we did something a little bit different um, with our governance um, we wanted to make it two-way accountability. And the worst bit of governance in, in schools traditionally is that governors get in the way, actually, that you find yourself doing things for governors that really aren't adding any value uh, and you wonder why, why you're doing that. So we made it a kind of two-way accountability model. But we don't have, in our, any of our schools, we don't have governance at school level. Uh, you aren't supposed to in multi-academy trusts anyway. So we have trustees that that um, I report to, and that's where we do all that traditional work around what are your results gonna be like and so on and so forth. Uh, but we have a lower level, which is more important, what we call our local stakeholder board. So we've kind of formalized our governance structure at school-based level around corporation. And the, we still call them governors, but their role is very much what the forum would be. And they engage, they actively engage parents, they actively engage staff, and they actively engage young people in what it means to be a, a pupil or a student at this school and within the trust. And if I, if the pupil voice side of it, for example, um, students in each of the schools, pupils in each of the schools have come up with what they call their bill of rights, what they think their rights should be. We, we particularly focus in on disadvantaged children and children with special educational needs to make sure that they construct those bills of rights. Because if you get it right for the that 20, 30 percent of children, you get it right for everyone. That's our belief. You don't just draw from volunteers because then you do get the traditional student councils doing it. Uh, and the, the when the local stakeholder board members work with young people, they ask them to what extent is that brought alive. It's the same with our wellbeing charter and other things that we have. So they're, they're, they are working in a two way process to say this is this is what the voice of the community is saying. This is what the young people and staff um, and therefore other governors are saying. And this is what needs to change. And they are it's a bottom up approach because that is the work that then goes on with the principals and the schools or the head teachers in the schools. We call them principals in our model. Uh, and which feeds into me and that informs our work so that's how we've come up with our model of cooperative governance our curriculum is built heavily upon diversity equity and inclusion uh, and we have an ethical approach um, to our curriculum we look uh, to develop confidence as learners and members of society so the curriculum isn't just what goes on in the classroom it is what goes on wider than that um, and we, we aim to meet the needs of disadvantaged children, children with additional needs first. Um, it's, the curriculum is driven in part by the law, what we have to do, what we have to do. We have a choice over some things, but we make sure that we have a very, very strong offer that children can tie into through young cooperatives. Um, they're not young enterprise um, models. Children are expected to leave a legacy in our trust. They are expected to uh, recognize that they don't just go through education, receive it and come out the other side, that their give back, if you like, is their legacy that they leave behind. So the young cooperatives are groups of children who are leading on something 
um, and they're not just filling out customer satisfaction questionnaires, which are these surveys that a lot of people do. Surveys will give you lots of information very quickly, and we do use them, but they are simply customer satisfaction surveys, and I don't value them. What I do value is the work when it's an activism, when children are saying, we don't like this, or this is what we're going to do. And I was very proud when I was principal at Tavistock College, still at that time, when Sir Francis Drake, who came from Tavistock, uh, was questioned around his um, his behaviours uh, when he was um, alive. It, the, we, the community don't go with us on this, by the way. The community fought absolutely and completely and said, this is not the place of the school to comment on this. Uh, he is a hero of our town. Uh, and it's a very, very right wing town in that sense. It um, would be with Geoffrey Cox there, wouldn't it? And he wrote and said, you can't get politically involved and it's a precursor to what we're going through now. But they did anyway. And it's really hard to fight the views of young people. It's quite easy to, for, for uh, people in our community to attack teachers and schools. But it's not quite so easy for them to attack groups of young people when they're saying this isn't right. And it, there were changes made and there, there are things on his statues now that say you know where he came from, what he did. And they demanded uh, that house, we shouldn't have had them. Uh, really should have thought ahead of this, but we still had um, some of the, the people of Tavistock, uh, the famous ones like Bedford and Drake and the other, were still our house names and they, they got them changed very quickly following that. Uh, but they don't do it in a way which is uh, undermining to the school or bringing it into disrepute. They do it through a proper organised approach, so being the young cooperatives. And, and that's where we get our mixed age and ethical approach to support the young people from. So we always have choices within our curriculum. I uh, mustn't forget that whatever comes down from the, from the DfE, we still have choice. Uh, uh, even Ofsted will accept we have choice as to how we how we organise and deliver our curriculum. If not the exact content, we have choice. And then we have cooperative professional development, which is a co-constructive uh, model of um, professional development, and that's for everybody. It's not just for teachers and leaders. Uh, and I'll show you how we bring that in in a moment. And then we have a cooperative pedagogy where we we use. Um, the principles of cooperative um, learning. We don't just follow Kagan or something like that. We use the principles behind cooperative learning to make sure our learning is uh, dialogic. And we set up our curriculum and pedagogy around midpoint and endpoint tasks. So we have a lot of the low stakes approaches with high impact for young people. And they create, um, they create bits of the curriculum for us to make sure we get that right. And you can move on to the next one, uh, Lee, please. So that's it. That's our model of school improvement. A lot of people have long, long documents, don't they, about their model of school improvement, but that's kind of it. It's based on Philip Woods' work. Uh, you might have read that from a while back now. It's a schema produced by him. But it's kind of a visual representation uh, of interconnectedness based on on values, agency and responsibility, which underpins our school improvement model. And that the horizontal connects and the, the vertical connects and the horizontal connects. And it's really a model of um, total quality management going back in time. Some of you be familiar with um, W. Edward Stemming's model of uh, total quality management. But basically, we don't suboptimize, I think is what I'm saying. We don't, um, we don't choose to put all of our effort. If there's one school not doing so well, we don't say, do you know what, we'll put all of our effort and money and support into that one and abandon the others. What we do is we gather together and that little space in the middle is where we want all of our schools to be. Um, and we do it through nourishing the individual um, intrinsic motivation, dignity, security, joy in work, all of that. We test ourselves, everything we do against that model all of the time. Um, and it's about solidarity um, and equal participation. Uh, so if we looked at it, if we looked at the vertical bit and you're looking at the, the holistic meaning and well-being. That's what I've really talked about already. It's how we co-design and refine and curate the bits of education that don't fit our model. Um, and we test everything about, back against that meaning. What are we here for? What are we doing? What are we here for? What are we doing? We, we test it against our values and principles all of the time. So we don't find ourselves in creating meaning in our trust of ever running out of things to do, by the way. We'll never run out of things to do because there's always things to do. But we test, we never get stuck we're testing it against the values. When, we, when we we're not quite sure what to do, we test it against those values and principles and create, is this fitting our meaning? Um, there's quite a lot of accountability within it because we're, because we're 
designing and refining and curating, we also have to check that it's having some sort of impact on young people and the adults in our community. So our holistic meaning has levels of accountability because we're creating the meaning for ourselves from that. Um, e even our KPIs and our, you know, what, what you measure is what's valued is done, isn't it? And we when we've got our um, KPIs, we're always saying, do they meet the values? And if not, we, do you know what? We're going to be brave and abandon them because they don't they don't fit. It doesn't work. So I can't see us engaging in any of that stuff that's come out recently that we were talking about earlier. Like we just won't engage in it. We will do what we've always done because we know that it's having the impact on young people. And it will be really hard, I think, to prove that we're not we're not unbiased. Very, very hard to prove that. So that if you really examine your meaning, sometimes you can just forget some of the things that come on high because they really don't matter. If you're doing the right thing for the right people, you, you know that it's working. And the well-being bit that, that comes underneath it is supported by the fact that you've got this line going across from transforming dialogue to power sharing. So like I've just said, when we're lo looking at transforming dialogue, we're not just listening. It's not just a consultation. It's proactive. It's the leadership of change. It's where we're testing our meaning all of the time. It's about transcending those narrow interests. So if we just did a parent survey every now and again and thought that somehow that made us cooperative because we were consulting, we would be bitterly disappointed because that's what Ofsted do, isn't it? They just do a customer satisfaction survey every now and again. Um, that, that, isn't, that isn't transforming dialogue because then you get people with their narrow interests and their little axes to grow grind coming in and telling you what's wrong with things and you will always get people that love you and people that hate you and when you're looking at 5,000 plus children so you're probably looking at 10,000 um, parents there you're always going to get that extreme from one to the other so that doesn't help us really what we do instead is create effective voice groups that are making an active contribution um, so we, you know, our parent forum, for example, isn't something where we ask how it's going for you. What we do is we teach them what we're trying to do and then ask for their opinion on shaping it. And those parent forums are really quite powerful because they're not they are helping you shape the future not commenting on what you're doing and it's exactly the same with young people in terms of student voice student voice isn't a student council that will go around with a um or it is sometimes where they go around with an ipad gathering have you say days that that's great you know it helps but it isn't really when you're transforming dialogue you're transforming dialogue by creating those young cooperative groups that are, are meeting and having their say and within that, by the way, if you're going to transform dialogue and you're going to share power, you have to have terms of reference. And that's where we get criticised as cooperators, isn't it? Where we're always having to sit down and work out terms of reference. Well, they really matter. They matter because they hold, they're the promise that you make that you're going to stick to these values and this is what it's going to look like and you're going to show up because you signed the terms of reference. So I get quite passionate around some of the models the corporation work across education just like they do elsewhere. Because if you don't pay attention to that, you're not really being a cooperator and you're just tinkering around the edges. So we really feel that we do have that line there going across about participatory democracy, I suppose, expressive democracy going down, is that we are sharing uh, power. So if we examine a few of them, if we looked at a uh, staff voice, some people think staff voice is, again, uh, the questionnaires, the surveys, having a meeting once in a while for people to tell you what's wrong with, with the world. That isn't staff voice within our trust. It's not staff voice that I believe in. So our staff voice is actually our school improvement group. So we set up, um, everybody belongs to one. You don't have to be a teacher or a teaching assistant. Um, you belong to a, a school improvement group, um, which is constructed around what people have said they'd like to develop in the school. We set up drive teams within, within there, um, sometimes called SIGLITs, because they're like SIG school improvement groups give birth to Siglets, but they're basically drive teams and they do uh, projects, plan, do, study, act, PDSAs, and they're not PhD projects, they, they're small and manageable and they work together, they come up with improvements, they share those improvements, 
then everybody agrees which were the best improvements and then we adopt those. So that is an ongoing model of, of driving school improvement through properly sharing power. But you have to give people the agency to do it. You have to give them the authority to lead. If you don't give them the authority to lead, you are just simply back to where you started. So you have to be honest with people and say, you can only work in this parameter. We're going to be developing our curriculum. I'd like some, some school improvement groups around that. Don't just let them do anything because then you can't deliver on your promises. So you, you do have to manage it. And that's absolutely fine to do that. But they're constantly collecting evidence. See where the accountability comes. This is where accountability is because because the people themselves are collecting the evidence and doing something with that evidence to drive our model forward. Um, we, we operate then within communities of practice across the schools in our trust, which is a more recent piece of work. And those communities of practice are in phases or subject teams, depending on, on the phase, whether they're, if you've got very, you've got early years, we can really drive early years, what it means to be a small school. We've got all this evidence that we've collected, all this work that we've done, all these things that people are interested about. But more than that, it helps the induction of new people into our organisation, whether that's students or uh, young people or staff themselves. Um, I'm not sure I've missed out there. So the other, the other bit, I suppose, which isn't there, I'd be lying if I said it's in our trust, but I want to exemplify it because it was in the previous school that I ran, is in that line going across of transforming dialogue, power sharing, supports wellbeing, when we set up groups um, that... We changed the whole structure of our school from houses that a lot of schools have houses and a lot of secondary schools have houses. We made them into specialist houses. So there was a specialism within each one. They were mixed age tutor groups and the tutor groups gave birth to uh, a specialism. So one of our houses was a sporting house, for example, and every day children would, would do sport in the mornings and tutor time. We solved all our punctuality and attendance problems that way. And they became the sports coaches for others in the school. We had a performing arts house. One of them was a one tutor group was a choir. One tutor group was the big band. One tutor group was a dance group. And they went on and they won. You know, we had a street dance a group that won pri national prizes. And this is the older children supporting the younger children to grow, really sharing the power and transforming the dialogue of what was possible. And what, what came with it, underpinning it all, is that sense of well-being, because the well-being comes not from cakes, although, Debs, I do agree, <laughs> cakes make a difference. I'm not, I'm not rubbishing cakes. But it's actually the dividend. We talk in cooperation, don't we, about where's the dividend? And people have struggled to find the dividend in education. For me, it's that bit at the bottom that the dividend is the social belonging and the interconnectedness that comes from getting all of this right. That's the dividend. That's the sense of well-being. Um, it's, it's the sense of that cooperative consciousness that you're all part of something and you're all growing together and you're never alone. You're never in that isolated misery that some schools, teachers or head teachers can find themselves in because you, you have shared that power with everybody and you've got all those voices uh, to help you make this collective decision making. And it impacts greatly on people's self-esteem. And we saw it during the pandemic. We saw that we didn't have people suffering in the same way in our schools, even though it was incredibly difficult. We had that sense of we, we know what we're doing and we have our self-esteem based upon this and we won't allow uh, other people to destroy what we're doing and won't allow the pandemic to destroy what we're doing. And it didn't. Um, so last slide, I think I've got to where I go on too long, is I suppose that's what we're trying to develop from a school improvement point of view, is to move really into that sense of democratic fellowship, this joint practice development. The, the success rate of sharing good practice on its own is very low. People often talk about that share, that share good practice. It's the success rate is really, really low on sharing good practice. Even what we've done today, unless we do something with it, the success rate from this information will be nothing. And we spend ages on sharing good practice. We spent a whole morning, haven't we, on sharing good practice. But actually, it's creating that professional dialogue from this and then your professional independence 
so you design something adjust it and learn whilst you're working on it that's what will make the difference that's why I call it transforming not sharing because we don't have professional development that is about sharing we have a transformational approach to it it's a joint activity in that sense um you know, if I had a pound every time someone said, yeah, people, I've told them that, but they don't do it. It's because you haven't constructed it together. You haven't coached people through the process of getting there. Um, and the professional independence, if you've got that right, and in elements of our trust, we have got that right, of being able to properly identify the talent and distribute that uh, approach across our schools um, to, to make it a real big difference. So what have I learned from it? Well, what I've learned from a democratic fellowship, there's hundreds every week of, of challenges that face us as school leaders um, in these really difficult times that we're in. But I think what I've learned from that approach I've just described is that you never run out of energy and you never run out of optimism and you never run out of understanding that if you stick to a set of values and that sense of solidarity that we can really have purposeful school improvement without a top down approach that's done to us waiting for the next thing to come down um, i've always been guided for it uh, you know i've worked in, in within the cooperative movements as 18 years old and i'm 55 lead is it my age before i'm 55 now um, and it's made the difference to keeping that positive energy that optimism and that onward learning journey that is never a done deal and that's helped me lead schools and it's helped grow that professional learning community that I will never ever uh, let go of and I started and we started by saying to do it you've got to be brave um, I believe that but we can develop that scope for mutuality I think and um, social action that we can work together on it and I think whilst we might be a smallish organisation, I choose to put my effort here. I choose to put my effort into this organisation. I choose to put my effort in the work that Lee's uh, trying to achieve and hope you come on the journey with us. Yeah. Questions? I was muted. I just said thank you, Sarah, so much. So much to think about there in terms of that Woods model of holistic democracy and those four central tenets of it. But I guess what really stood out, I mean, I made a load of notes, but what really stood out for me was that notion of promise and dividend. So the promises you make, that there's some degree of vision that everyone is signing up to, to be an activist, but the promise in it is in itself the dividend, because by signing up to it, your well-being through empowerment through agency and through not being heard, but becoming part of the movement together is what builds your community, builds your sense of belonging and so on. Yeah, and, it, and it's hard work. And I said hmm. that you've got to be committed to it. Um, I don't think I'm breaking any, any confidences because in the public domain, but there is a, a, a local cooperative multi-academy trust that unfortunately is being rebrokered at the moment and it's very very sad for me to hear that um, in the southwest because they're good people and they're people I've known for a long time but the reason they're being rebrokered is because they didn't that, that slide where I showed the fox going with the hounds they decided to swim against the tide and you've got to, you've got to go with what's going on but you've got to you've got to understand why you're doing things and you've got to be prepared to take some things into the centre and, and give agency where you can. Uh, and that's a really deliberate, it's deliberate practice and deliberate thinking that you, that you have to go through in order to achieve it. So it's not easy. And it's... Yeah. yeah. It's and when you're saying that swim against the tide, you are, you are sort of describing, I guess, a sense of um, the extent to which in some places schools are left to their own destiny rather than... A community of cooperators together um, that are both tight on accountability and mutuality. Yeah, yeah because exactly. and I'm not using the word like support because you're not talking about support, are you? Because support says I've got the power and I'm holding you up. What Correct. you're talking about is a collaboration that builds that development rather than I tell you what to do, even if it's in a nice way. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you, 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 you're both under the seesaw. We're in the middle because you can just be supportive and helpful, 
but it's kind of patronizing to people to do that actually because you're you're thinking for them what you think mm-hmm. the solutions might be that's that doesn't work Ridiculous. neither does it work to do the other other end of the spectrum which is the approach we're supposed to take which is centralize everything and tell everybody what to do and hold them to account that doesn't work either so all i'm saying is there is something in the middle and that something in the middle is in enhances our work and that is cooperation mm. Any thoughts from elsewhere? Stunned into silence or bored. They might be bored. This is a possibility. <laughs> no, not at all. I've really found this morning really useful. Some things we, we as we're only been our trust just over a year now, um, and due to COVID and of one thing or another, we got that excited and wanted to do so much within week one. And we've had to strategically look at how we're going to develop things over a sustainable period of time. So this morning's been great with lots of different ideas that we can use. Um, so, yeah, it's been really, really yeah, and, and Laura, I was thinking about Axia um, was early on. Sarah was talking about kind of um, the courage to shine light in the dark corners when you're working mutually. And I was thinking, I don't want to talk too much about it because you'll be talking about it tomorrow. But that notion of how you've been working on school improvement through your project focus yeah. across the schools, you know, yeah. and how at your last board meeting, one of the, I think James said it actually, um, about how that working together has allowed you to be brave because the fear factor, the having to, as Sarah called it, is gone. You are prepared to be open, honest, transparent, and work together on on those areas that you're most concerned about. Yeah, it's really useful. I'm gonna have to go, but I will uh, see you this afternoon. Yeah, okay. Back on at two. Yeah, back on at two. See you later, everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, John's raised, raised his hand. Yeah, Sarah, I'm, I'm just so thanks again. It's, it's been good to be in touch with you over the last couple of years. Um, I think what I picked out, you know, my, my takeaways, as they say, I think, first of all, the realism on the journey and, the, and the, the phases of investigating and exploring cooperation, where, you know, I think it's it often starts with a pre-existing set of relationships. That's quite common. And people who like working together but there's a transition that's needed to go from that professional friendship model into hard-nosed focus on purpose. And I think that's exactly what you've been describing because, yeah, to use some slightly cheap phrasing, I I think there's always a risk of it being woolly liberalism. You know, we're, we're nice people, we want to do the right thing. But actually when you come down to it, you're now very, very clearly looking at some of the themes that have come up during the morning and agency, the uh, the sense of belonging from the young people, the children that, that you are working with and supporting, but actually that you know the reality of well, if it doesn't improve their opportunity, doesn't deliver on aspirations, then it is actually a bit mm-hmm. of woolly-minded stuff. Mm-hmm. And I think that chimes with what we've had to we've we've sort of done a bit of growing up over the last two or three years nationally as well. I think in the group saying. It, it is about being good with schools, not just a slogan. We want to make sure we've got really superb learning communities driven by strong values and principles all the way through. And I, I think we're on that case. And people like you, if I may say so, are really helping contribute to that sharper focus. So it's appreciated. And I, I, re- I think it's great for other people to hear that journey. It, it's it's quite a complicated one. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm. I've been recreating what cooperative education should be like for since 2009 when I first visited the wonderful Patsy Kane. Yes. Um, uh, she she was the one that got us on our journey originally in previous school, and it, it's it is about co-constructing it and and living within the world that we're living in but sticking to what really absolutely matters and you're right it is the biggest criticism people make and I and it's not that we're not nice people but it's it isn't just about being nice with people but there is an element of uh, psychological safety which I think needs to be brought out that all these changes and developments and giving people um agency and the authority to lead but holding them to account having the responsibility that there's this responsibility in there as well um it does need to have its slightly tougher edge but there has to be psychological safety in there and i think in in many 
other organizations, we don't have that psychological safety. And whenever I come back to, and I look, linked in with both you and Lee not that long ago, um, it was like a revisiting. I told you at the time, it was like coming home because you know when you're working with corporators and you know when people are operating under a set of values versus people who are out for themselves, you can feel the difference. And that's what I want of all of our schools when you walk into them to feel that. I want people to feel that. That's and why it's, where you, it's where you started, actually. Culture is so important. Yeah. And it's radical. Culture is everything. Culture yeah. is everything. Yeah. And uh, um, transforming dialogue, which really stands out. I mean, it's, it, in a sense, it's what jo John was drawing on there, this kind of notion that it isn't coziness. It isn't simply niceness for niceness sake. It isn't wooliness. It's actually tough. To steal Jonathan's point from earlier, there is constructive dissent in this model, but it's done in a place where there is psychological safety because everyone is signed up to that culture. We share the foundations of our houses. Yeah, okay. Um, great. I think, unless I can see any other hands raising, I'm going to close there for lunch and I will be back with you all at two. I'm just going to pause the recording.